So part of the problem is availability, not so much. The availability for most senior step sex is not that hard, especially if they live in a assisted living or retirement, especially for men. Men in assisted livings are very, very polite. They have a tendency, those that are sexually active, they want to be sure that all the women in the facility have sexual experiences. And today <laughs> starts Mondays, it's A1. And Tuesdays, it's 2B. And Thursdays, it's 4. You know, they make sure they get the whole facility well taken care of, which is great. Uh, sexually transmitted diseases in senior populations is huge. It's, going, it's on the rise. They don't wear condoms. They really should wear condoms. They don't wear condoms. Women don't ask their sexual partners to wear condoms because they don't really believe that that's a problem. HIV risk has gone up in seniors. Highest, highest population increase is with seniors. Florida, as you imagine, is worse than anywhere else in the country. <clears throat> Self-gratification, it's taboo still. You know, talking about vibrators when I was 27 was stressful. Now, you know, I can do it here because we're all together and we know each other well now. But it's not something you really bring up. I, 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 most practitioner, healthcare practitioners don't say, do you have a vibrator? Are you still sexually active? Do you know about lubrication? Do you know how to care for yourself? You know how to do a breast self-exam, but do you actually know how to do the vibrator? Cultural attractiveness, old people, they're, what is the biggest industries right now for aging, do you suppose? Biggest? Cosmetics. Cosmetics. The anti-aging creams, the plastic surgeons, the aging shampoos, the gray aways, the, all, the no wrinkle world. It's like, really? Aging is bad. We still believe it. Our culture, America, aging is bad. Although we all want to get there. We don't want to die before. But it's not good. We're a youth-oriented society. Other societies are, you know, they revere the elderly. You get more status and power as you get older. In America, you get less status, less power as you age. So you become less attractive. Age differences, again, they're breaking barriers all the time. Women with younger men used to be so taboo. Now you see it and you're like, oh, cool. Can you keep up with her? I mean, she's like a marathon runner and he's kind of a slug. <laughs> and vice versa. Can he keep up with her? She's, you know, 20 years younger. Can I ask a question? It's, I don't know if there's a definitive answer at all, but a lot of women, even if they have been very sexually active, when they go through menopause, just the whole... It just dies. Right. So how does that relate to elderly people wanting to be sexually active? Number one. So she said uh, when women go through menopause, they lose their libido. Uh, <coughs> true, partly, but also becomes more painful and more uncomfortable. And sexual arousal time takes longer. And unless they have a patient partner, it can be an unsatisfying experience. So through menopause, after menopause, Dr. Ruth, this is her, lubrication, 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 lubrication. Find one that you love. Find a lubricant that works for you. But if they have no drive, it doesn't matter. Why are they even wanting to be sexually active? If you just literally don't even, I mean, my sister is like, I have just no desire. If you have no desire, no libido, it's completely gone, it's nothing. Uh, you can try a small amount of estrogen, like I said, uh, might help. I, I really question what her libido was before menopause. Again, a lot of women use menopause to, to finally jump off the sex wagon. Say, oh, thank God, that's over. I don't have to do that. I don't have to try. I don't have to have that Friday night thing anymore. Awesome. I just can't do it. They haven't made a Viagra for women. 
Some women have tried Viagra and it helps. Uh, it's, it's, off, it's not FDA approved. Um, interesting, the amount of money we spent on Viagra because men have much less difficulty with sexual arousal and an orgasm. Women, multiple reasons that they have a harder time with arousal and orgasms. Well, through the lifespan, through beginning to end. You know, for all kinds of pelvic pain, um, sexually abused, and just a, a myriad of reasons women have a harder time being sexually active than men in general. But our money goes for Viagra, not towards helping women achieve orgasm. Don't ask me. Lubrication. If you say nothing else to your patients, or yourselves, or whatever, get a lubricant that you love. Try them all. There's one called Good Clean Love that's actually made in Eugene, Oregon. And I think she's now taking it worldwide or something. It's all organic. It's, of course, it's all organic. It's all natural ingredients. And it's, it's not like KY jelly. If you think lubricant is KY jelly, think again. There's better lubricants. How do we find the person who's it's, it's, I think it's in Walmart now. I think it's oh. like, she's, if not, go online and find out where you can get it. Good, clean love. Um, time of day. So seniors that struggle and just say, oh my God, I'm so exhausted. I mean, really, we got to go to dinner, have wine, go to a movie and have sex? I don't think so. And sleep at 9 or 10 or whatever. So one thing to help them think about, when not only just the position, but... Time of day, so what Dr. Ruth has said in her columns over the years is, you know, if you're having a hard time being sexually active, don't wait till you're tired to try. You're re you are retired, so have breakfast, go for your walk, get your whole GI system, she'll, she'll even say, have an enema, get yourself cleaned out, do whatever you need to do, and then have a date and then have as much time as you need to have. You're awake, you're alert, you feel good, and you're ready for sex. Think of sex as like preparing for a marathon or preparing for a workout or preparing for something. You, you get yourself together for it, you feel good, and then you go have sex. I'm just a doctor. Dildos, awesome. So if, if uh, erectile dysfunction is a problem, you got to think about bringing adaptive devices. I always love that, like your wheelchair. Walk and go. Adaptive devices can be dildos, can be vibrators. Bring toys into the bedroom, even if it hasn't been something that's been going on ever. You're thinking, oh, God, the internet. You get things sent to you in little brown boxes that don't have dildo inside. You know, it's all good. A lot of communication with your partner. Look. You just had prostate surgery. And, yeah, this is really hard, but we can still have intimacy. You can still have arousal without having without having a, a rectal. Sorry, without actually having an or orgasm. You can still have arousal. You can still have a meaningful time together. It's hard shift in the brain. It's a change that needs to happen. But a lot of men after prostate surgery just stop having sex. They try Viagra, it doesn't work, and then they just stop having sex. Uh, before Viagra, I worked in a urology office for a couple of years, uh, implants were really um, popular. And either a permanent implant to maintain an erection, which looked a little weird, you had to wear certain pants that were really baggy otherwise, Weird. Um, or even the ones that you could like pump up. Still a good alternative if Viagra doesn't work. Still a good alternative to get an erection. Because that's part of what people, what men, some men believe is the only thing that declares we are intimate, we are having sex, this is good. Are they still having orgasms and ejaculating with Viagra no. and uh, implants? Let's say, 70 80% of sex is in your head. So when they do spinal cord, 
injury, like kids in their 20s. I teach them how to have a meaningful experience in their brain, how to get stimulated if it's their earlobe that isn't paralyzed or whatever it is to have sexual arousal and satisfaction. They won't ejaculate, but they will have an internal orgasm. So when the body doesn't work, you go to the brain. Because really your brain is what sex is about anyway. I mean, that's the piece that you have to get over. I don't know, being Catholic and, you know, whatever your issues were is it when you were younger. You have to get over that old people don't do it. You always have to go back to your brain and say, what is my brain going to do to stretch to allow me to have sexual intimacy? Vibrator, masturbation. Oh, oops. Treat chronic pain first. So the other thing is, so if you have arthritis, you're not going to sit down and have sex first thing in the morning because that's when your arthritis, if it's osteoarthritis, is worse. So take your Advil, put your little Bengay on. They have odorless Bengay, if that's, that's not a turn on. I like the smell of Bengay. It's so much better than other smells in nursing homes. Anywho, <clears throat> um, treat the chronic pain. Take your pain medication. Do what you need to do to feel okay before you try to have sex. If you don't have a sexual partner, vibrator, masturbation, just give permission that it's okay to continue being sexually active even if you're widowed. STDs, like I talked about, 15% of new HIV cases, folks older than 50. Most common STDs, all ages. So you gotta start looking for chlamydia, gonorrhea, in old folks now. And you gotta have condoms in your offices if you're a geriatrician. Really? Okay, uh, care communities and sex. <clears throat> Let's just take a moment because how many of you work in foster homes? There it's not as much, you only have like five people at the most. How many in assisted living? How many in nursing homes? How many, what is that? Hospital. Hospital. This is not going to help you in the hospital as much. Maybe they'll come in from the nursing homes having been accused of being a sexual predator. So sexual predators in care communities um, are problematic. And the problem with true sexual predators, now I'm not talking about little demented peeps that want to have sex or want to be intimate with somebody and they're just going about it in a very obvious, weird way. Sexual predators are people that have gotten away with being predatory their whole life and never got caught. They estimate for every one predator that's arrested of molesting or raping, probably a hundred that aren't, that fly under the radar, that tell people, if you tell, I'll kill you, or I'll kill your parents, or I'll do something. So most predators make it to old age, and then they get into a nursing home or a care community. And they're different. And I know the difference. I've had to evict a couple. Because who do they go for? They go for the resident or the patient in the facility that can't talk, that's mute, that's had a stroke, that doesn't yell out, that's bed bound. Now, s seniors in care communities that are trying to hook up, they go for someone about equal to their cognitive abilities. They go look for <coughs> someone to, to visit with and to develop a relationship with. They're not going around to the room at the end of the hall that the aides never get to, and nobody walks by, and then they're found in there. <clears throat> How do you know if you have a sexual predator in your population? <clears throat> One, the stomach, the gut thing. How many of you, I'm mean, gonna talk mostly to women, because guys don't tend to do this as much as women do. How many of you have ever had that ick feeling with some guy that came into your world? 
You ever just go, something's wrong. So they've done studies on the ick. And it's interesting what women do with it. They immediately register and disregard and go to nice. When they interview women that have been raped, what happens is they're being approached, they get the ick, they try to be nice, and they get raped. If you get the ick on a patient, on a resident, don't wait. Make, put it in the ra make a radar about it. Now, you could be wrong. I, I think mostly you're not wrong. It's really quite remarkable how much you're not wrong. You need to, if you're in a care community, you need to talk to your staff, and you all need to have agreements around this ick thing. You need to say, CNA, nurse assistant, community care provider, whoever you are, if you get that, I want you to bring it to me. I want you to bring it to one of the supervisors, one of the managers, one of the owners, whatever, however big this is. And I want to talk about it. Because I want to be sure we're all doing something about it. I don't want to wait until some family walks by that door and sees somebody being molested. <clears throat> so if you get the ick, talk about it. I, I don't know if it's in the culture in your place, but you can go back after today and say, I want this to be part of our culture. If you see a resident's hand, and it's mostly it's like 90% men, so I'm going to say men mostly, if you see a male resident's hand going up a female resident's nightgown, skirt, dress, whatever they have on, and she's not able to consent. That's it. You need a huge plan around preventing that person from being around vulnerable seniors, being around vulnerable patients. I can't believe it. I'm driving over here from state in uh, Blackview. I'm driving over here. I'm about 20 minutes from here. And I'm getting myself together to talk about sex. And I get a call from the nurse at our care community. She said, Liz, I can't believe it. I won't use the real name. I'll call him uh, Tom. Tom was seen putting his hand up Betty's uh, dress and moving her depends and putting his hand into her crotch, essentially. Are you kidding me? I mean, Betty is obtunded. She's got no words. She just kind of sits there. And he's walkie-talkie, moving. He goes to all the activities. He's very uh, early. <laughs> yeah. And he's been trying to get into this other woman's bedroom, but they've been kind of keeping an eye on it and thought, well, maybe something's brewing. She's kind of high-functioning. So what do we do? We have to move him to the all-men's house. We have to move him to a house. And if our all-men's house is full, we have to move him to a house that have really alert females. They can say, get out of here. Because he won't go to someone that pushes him away. He will only go. And now we know he will only go to someone that can't yell. So it's on us as healthcare <coughs> practitioners working with geriatrics, working with old people, to really be vigilant. And I, used to, I can remember thinking about the training on this. It's like, oh, you always say they're dirty old men, and we have this whole thing about it. And it's not true. They're just demented. They don't know what they're doing. I can, I can hear myself saying that. For years I said that, and I taught it, and I believed it, until I really did more research on predators. And there's a difference between old men trying to get it on and predatory behavior. And you just need to know that. How often or common is this? No one knows. There was like one study done in a, I think it was like a Midwest state. And they, they said it, they had no way of knowing because nursing homes cover it up. It doesn't get investigated by the police. It Do just gets split. Like, if, if, like think of all the people who have been in prison for rape. And, they, and then they get released and then they grow old. Well, those you get to track. You actually should track. Do you have a criminal history? Do they? Because you need to know that. Um, but you're right. They're out. They usually have to have, um, they have to tell the, everybody for the rest of their life where they live because they can't live near a school. They can't live blah. 
I mean, they have some kind of red flag. But like I said, probably 99% aren't caught. Is that predatory behavior to men only? Is that predatory behavior with men only? It's most common. It's more common with men. Uh, women, to a lesser degree, but it, it, I'm sure it does happen. I just, we don't see it as often. Uh, when women are um, molesting young people, they're usually, they have to wait for the young person, the young boy usually, to be old enough to have an erection to have, you know, to molest or rape. So they're a little bit older. But there are, I'm, there are predatory women, and you got to watch. I've not seen it ever in 30 years. I've not seen a woman go into another woman's bed or into a guy's bed or, or whatever and try and do anything with them. That doesn't mean it's not out there. Yes? So the, the incidents that happened this morning, are yes. there going to be charges pressed? Or are you just... We're going to talk to her family, we're going to talk to everyone, and we're going to move him and report it to the state. Yes, this occurred, and this is what we've done about it. Uh, by, the, oh, by the way, so if you, have, if you are in a nursing home or something, you need to change your mind about putting the end-of-life hospice residents in the quiet part of the nursing home. There's a tendency to say, you know, the family can go hang out there and we'll put them at the end of the hall where it's a little more private and quiet. Well, when the family goes away, it's private and quiet. So your most vulnerable need to be right up by the nurse's station. Everybody's walking by, peeking in, and you gotta go in and say, hey, how you doing? And you know, no response, whatever. But you're constantly, constantly looking. For those that can't speak. Barriers to intimacy in the care community. Especially if you're Medicaid and you don't have a private room. It can be very hard for people that still have community dwelling partners to have time to, or a place or privacy to have sex. Uh, I have uh, spouses that ask me, oh, Liz, so. My wife and I, I know she's living here. Um, she knows who I am still. Is it okay to have sex? I'm like, you, you really have to ask me if it's okay to have sex in this care community. How sad, but it's true. So, all doors, the new, the new regs on all community-based care is that every resident has a lockable door and you have to have a service plan for a non-lockable door. We've had it in reverse, we've had needs lockable door because they're territorial or because they want that privacy or whatever and they still know how to use a key. But all care communities, community-based care, it's a federal law, it's not a state law, a federal law, has to have locks on their doors now, which is a good thing. It's hard if you have a roommate, one of you knows how to use a lock, one of you doesn't, one of you likes to leave the door unlocked when you go down for dinner, one of you doesn't, it's gonna be kind of some fun issues. Um, any rate, if you, write, if you put privacy on the door, what does that tell the whole staff? Oh, they're doing it. Oh, no. So what we do, but of course now we know, uh, but we'll say under construction or danger or you know painting or something, we'll put on the door so other residents don't wander in and, the lock, and lock it, of course. But so staff is just reminded not to go in. It isn't quite so flagrant. Um, most families actually end up taking their loved one home to have sex, or I have one guy that tells me, you know what, we just do a date and we go to the hotel. And we spend the afternoon and then I bring her back and I'm like, that's great. She comes back really happy. She comes back happy. Determining consent, consent with demented folks. And their decisional capacity. So you say, oh, they're demented lives, they can't possibly give consent. Yes, they can, they do it all the time. And legally, they have the right to associate with whomever they want. They have the right, whether their daughter likes it or not. And the care communities have a duty to protect. 
So how many of you have residents in your care home that don't want to sit with each other at the breakfast table or lunch or dinner? Hate each other. They'd never sit together for love or money. You have to keep them apart or they're like going to kill each other. Never happened to you. Everybody get along? Or how many have to sit by each other? That's my place. I have to sit next to her. I have to sit next to him, right? They are choosing friends at any age, at any level of dementia. You ch they choose friends. I don't know what it's based on sometimes. Is it looks? Is it smell? Is it just size? Do they look like someone they know? Do they? I had these two women who believed the other one was their husband. And they both had short haircuts, and they just believed the other one. They call each other, and they're hard enough hearing, and they didn't get it. <laughs> they never figured out that the other one was a woman. And they would go, and they would adjust their collar and make sure their hair was okay. And one would, you know, get them an extra plate of food or something. And they, like for years, took care of each other. And they called each other Wally and Paul. It's like, okay, Wally and Paul it is. We're all good at that. And the families got into it. And they were good with it because it was so sweet and so nice. They had a connection. They weren't alone. And their families could say, oh, thank God they're not alone. So, to determine if someone's consenting, everybody has to be involved in the discussion. So, two people are hooking up, and you're like, oh, wish they weren't. Uh, but they are. So, all the staff needs to know about it. The spouse, if they still have a community dwelling spouse, needs to know about it. You, you just got to call them children, you got to call the daughter. There's always the daughter that gets unglued. Mom would never. I'm like, yes, she does. Mom would. So that 70 and 90 year old, they that came to see me, the daughters of the 90 year old were I great. And we had so many meetings and they said, but Liz, we put her into the all female home so that she would not find a man. She had an affair on my dad when he was dying. She was awful, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, and she's the same woman. And she has the right, and she beeline for this guy at the first community activity where everybody's all together. She went right for him. I said, she's choosing, he's agreeing, but I'm not gonna do about it. And they have the right to associate. They have that right, yeah. Well, we have a situation where we've got, it's memory care, and so the, the husband is at the facility, the wife still lives at home, and comes and visits, and um, so they've, um, she will come in and he'll be holding hands, you know, with the resident that they become friendly and she's demanding that that does not happen anymore. Is, what do you recommend in that situation? Well, it, it's not easy. It's a lot of conversations that you know. We'll call the wife Betty. You know what? Your husband is very sweet with these women. He, he takes care of them. He's nice to them. They, they are drawn to him and like him too. Now, when you're not here, he, he's not gonna be alone. It's just who he is. We can't prevent them from holding hands. It's not legally, it's not legally what we can do. He has the right to associate with you. These words are so great. He has the right to associate with whomever he will. We have to protect her from him or him from her if, they, if we think that one of them's uh, pushing it and the other one isn't consenting, then we intervene. And I, I know you two are married. I know that. And then she gets mad. And I'm going to move her and say, you know, I, I'm going to move him. I've had somebody move him. And I had somebody demand he go to the all male home. He had this sweet relationship, held hands, they kiss occasionally, pat, pat, pat. They followed each other everywhere, and she said, I'm moving him. I want him moved to the men's house. She had the right to move him because she was his health care representative. She didn't have the right to tell the staff to keep him apart. Now, the staff tried because we have a, an alarm because it's a memory care. So we knew who was at the gate when we tried to move him, but she would come right back in. It's hers. <laughs> Well, I'm going to take it one step further then. Now she gets the ombudsman involved. Good. And he comes in and says, 
you have to keep that separate. No, the ombudsman, who does the ombudsman represent? Should be the resident. Period. He's res representing the family. Then. No, and then you have to call the ombudsman's ombudsman. <laughs> the head of ombudsman misses. No, truly, the ombudsman represents the resident. Is the resident being taken advantage of? Is the resident being violated? Is the resident upset by this relationship? No, no, no. Does the resident find comfort in this relationship? Yes. Is he seeking it? Yes. Is it consensual? Yes. Sorry, the wife has a problem. The wife isn't my resident. They don't know their job. <clears throat> And he, really, you can just call their supervisor, forget who she is, but she's totally reasonable. So, um, kind of odd situational question. In the event where, say, a gentleman is in a memory care facility and has dementia, and his wife does not, she lives outside the facility, but this person that he's holding hands with or whatnot, if he believes that is his wife, would you, as staff, then remind him that it's not, or let him go on with the, the belief that that is his wife. And because it kind of wonders as far as is it is it permission from them if they truly think that that's somebody else that does live outside the facility. So if you're confused, if he's calling him her his wife, and should the staff intervene and say? That's not your wife, Tom. Your wife is Betty Lou, lives in the community. That's not your wife. Um, what's the goals of care? The goals of care in memory care are that they are comfortable, content, happy, whatever word you want, living in your care community. That they can find meaningful relationships, that they can uh, every day feel safe, cared for, ideally loved. We ask our staff to be loving towards them. We ask our staff to develop relationships so that they feel safe in a home. We call them homes. So the goal of care is he feels safe. Reality orientation went out the window. Now sometimes it helps to kind of bring back, now remember, now how old your daughter, so you have to get home and take care of your daughter and she's, how, now how old is she now, does she? Doesn't she have two kids? Two? Oh yeah, they're my grandkids. I can walk her from taking care of her kids that are five. I can move her to her kids are growing up and they're okay and not be upset. But if they believe it's their wife, I don't, again, the quality of their life matters more to me than their community dwelling spouse. And their option is they can move them. But that makes sense and that gives you some words and some tools and yes, language. You. And you want to be kind. I mean, imagine how distressing it is to the spouse. I mean, if they were really close, I mean, it's like walking in on an affair. If she hasn't evolved to, oh my God, how wonderful I as a caring wife have so much love for my spouse that when he's with somebody else in a care community and he's finding comfort, that fills my heart. And now that's an evolved human being and probably someone that's gone to some support groups and understands what true love can look like. On the same note that he was talking about, um, if they did consent and they did have sexual relations is it a uh, confidentiality that if the wife asks? You know, does she have the right to know? Uh, is she a guardian? Is she the guardian? Yes. She's a guardian, not just a wife, and not just a power of return for health care. Um, then she does it. So. Interesting that she got guardianship. Usually. I wonder, when I hear that and that much angst, he's had affairs. And she's got baggage on that. She's got, she's got issues around that. 
and I don't know if you have a social worker or if there's anybody, any support group that you could hook her into to, to just talk about this issue. Um, this may be a student question. I'm just a student that's interested in this. But I have when somebody enters a care facility, are there supports in place to help, like for this example, help the wife, maybe she um, has, does not have memory impairment, but to help her kind of start her life in a different way? Are there supports for spouses of uh, people entering memory loss communities to support them? There's there are support groups in almost every community from the Alzheimer's Association. I do one classes. Every community that I don't think a foster home does, but I know that um, memory care residential care facilities have to have a support group offered at two different times monthly. So we have one at noon and we have one at 5 p.m. every month for for families to come to and talk about why on earth are they cooking with quinoa instead of white potatoes? You know, ask all those questions. Or why did they let my husband sleep with so-and-so? And it comes up. So they do, there's a lot, but I just don't know about foster homes. If I, I think that would be possible. So there would be an opportunity then to help people have like a lecture like Yes, poss yes. Um, usually the support groups in the care community are run by the social worker or the our family services coordinator. And then if there's questions outside of their scope of practice, they'll bring somebody in to have that dialogue. Where are we at? Did you have a question or are you telling me Liz one minute? No, I, I did want to, I didn't realize that you recognized me. I thought you were pointing to somebody in front. Um, I want to interrupt real quickly and let you all know that we have our local Alzheimer's Association rep here with us today. Christina, can you just raise your hand? For those oh, she's right there know. at your table. You can uh, just jump on her. She loves this topic. Yeah. So, <laughs> after we break, you might want to get to know Christina and talk to her about the groups and stuff she <coughs> offers. And that is all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Um, care plans. So you got a care plan about it. You got it. We call ours, you know, a concern about intimacy between blah and blah is developing. It's our intimacy care plan. And what we put in there is <clears throat> descriptions of consenting and non consenting behavior. Consenting behaviors, they're really very simple. Are they smiling when they approach each other? Both of them? Are they welcoming? Come sit here. Hey, hey, hi, hey. No words, going up, pat, pat, pat. Come, come, come. Happy, seeking. Do they tell friends or family, oh, she, her, mm, yes. Whatever their language is, are they having some way they're communicating? And they will, it's not hard. It's not vague, it's not gray, it's black and it's white. This is one time when it's absolutely clear that you're consenting or not. It's absolutely clear. Non-consenting, avoid, shut down. I did a consult once at a memory care community who this man moved in who had recent, his wife had died like the week before and the kids came from out of state and placed him in the care community because he had Alzheimer's. He got there, and within days, he repartnered. He's, you know, you know, you, you know this too that there's people that have to be married. They will be married. When they go into a care community, they will find a partner within the first week. You can move them to any house you want. Really, almost any gender. Sometimes they will partner with somebody because it's how they're hardwired. They have to be married. So he found himself a wife. She was more impaired than him. She kind of looked like his wife. And he began to do what he did as a, as a husband, which was rule the show. He was, he was the rooster. He took his wife where she needed to go. He was the driver. He was the bill payer. He was the everything, everything, everything. So then he comes to the care community. He believes this woman is his wife, or he's going to make her his wife. Takes her wheelchair, moves her around wants to be sitting with her all the time, wants to do all this. She can talk some, she's with it. 
he wants to go help her be pottied and trained, and like, no, you can't come to the bathroom with her. And she initially really likes the attention. And then the staff notice she's not talking as much. She's losing weight. She's kind of trying to stay out of his line of sight. Things shift, so just because a relationship is all good, just like high school, good for one week, horrible the next, then good, then bad, you have service plans coming and going in and out. So it might not be good. So she's avoiding, she's isolating, she looks kind of fearful, she kind of cringes. I actually watched the interaction and she just turned her head from him. That was her whole statement of, I don't want you here, and he doesn't read it. He's like moving ahead, being an overpowering spouse guy. So moved him to different neighborhoods, and he found somebody else that wanted to be married too. You've got to play matchmaker, by the way. I mean, he works really great. You always just, you know, I, you know, I think he's cute. He'll like her, and she know, and they both want somebody. There's people that need to be in relationship, and if you try to keep them out of it, it won't work. Uh, what do I do if my wife wants to have sex with me but forgets who I am? Two questions. These are all real. Uh, it's a hard one. I, uh, families, spouses that are dealing with somebody with Alzheimer's are concerned about, you know, am I violating her or him? He doesn't really know me or she doesn't really know me. Or we finish and she can't remember we've had sex and wants to have sex again. Some people call it a dream. We'll call it a nightmare. No, you choose where you stand on that one. But my counsel to them is if she or he enjoys it in that moment and you know if somebody's enjoying it, if they are with you and they're liking it and they're laughing and they're smiling and they're participating, great. The minute that stops, you stop having sex with them because they won't know what it is. And they'll because especially with Alzheimer's, you know, the onion is peeling back and they're moving back into their, their memories of being a child, you're not gonna have sex with a child. So if, if they are young adult and they believe they're still taking care of their kids and they're married and this nice guy is here, great. But when it moves, then it stops. Get these all the time. So. John's being sexually inappropriate. Can you order hell doll? What's in it? Good old days. You could just drug the crap out of anybody. It was so fun. Loved it. Um, yeah, so what's wrong with that? Facts. Why? What is wrong with that? What? You're wanting to sedate him. That's number one. Good. What's the other thing that's really hard for a provider? No definition. Of? Yeah, what the heck does inappropriate mean? And you know, it can mean a, just a huge array of things. He gets an erection when a 20-year-old blonde girl is giving him a shower. <laughs> totally inappropriate. Not. When that happens, you close the curtain, say, I'll be back, I'll give you some privacy. Of course, there's going to be turn on if you give some visual stim. That's not inappropriate. That's like normal sexual physiology. He's crawling into bed. Every night he gets up at 2 a.m. and he crawls into bed with Ruth. Well, that's, that certainly seems inappropriate. Give me more. Well, so then I call and I say, so does he get up and pee at 2? Well, yeah. Is his bed wet? Well, yeah. Is her bedroom right next to his, well, yeah. Is he directionally, does he have executive function problems? Well, I don't know. Does he know left and right? Uh, I don't know. Okay, well, he's just opening door, going door, getting bed. Is he trying to have sex with her? Is he, you know, getting on top of her? Or is he just saying, move over? Getting him getting in here. So he's seeking warmth, dry bed. So the answer to that one is definitely held off. No, the answer to that one is when he gets up at two, you, get, you run right in there and change that bed. And then you redirect him and say, oh, I made it all nice and warm for you. Come on back in here. 
Now, if he is getting physically violent, trying to get at a female resident and you have no other beds and the state won't let you evict him and you have to wait 30 days, there's nowhere to put him and he's really physically violent, aggressive, delusional, she's mine, I own her, he's mine, I'm gonna get her, I'm gonna get him, I'm gonna do whatever, then a psychotropic might be helpful to reduce the delusion, might. All psychotropics, Dyprexa, Seroquel, held off, they're all sedating. That's all we're really doing. So what would you do in a situation where um, a 94-year-old man, he's constantly unzipping his pants and playing with himself in front of everybody, and he just won't quit? So would that be a good time? Is he demented? Yeah, of course. Well, not necessarily. I mean, sometimes, I also think now what's happening? Oh, it's terrible. I, oh, they're faking the the MOCA tests, they're faking the mini mentals, they're faking the cognitive exams and entering care communities with diagnosed impairments, which you know we have no way, I mean MRIs can help a little but not much, they can't diagnose Alzheimer's, really it's all diagnosed on the MOCA or, or the cognitive assessment. So they're coming in with lower numbers when they're not actually that impaired or they've had one isolated stroke somewhere a billion years ago and they have a entrenched single delusion but they never ever ever progress and they know exactly what they're doing. So, um, yeah, we have a guy like that that we're trying to evict. He, he doesn't even make it in the men's house. The men want to beat the crap out of him because he's so inappropriate. And now the kids tell us, yeah, he, he messed with everybody. He was, he's a predator. So there's a male inpatient nursing home, I think it's a nursing home um, unit in Portland somewhere that's going to be the only place that can take him. He knows what he's doing and yeah. he tries to cover it up. So uh, one, I would give him, I'd zip up his pants, I'd sew up his pants. Pardon? I'd sew up his pants, that's I'd put I'm a onesie on him, I'd, I'd put suspenders on him, I would you know, make it so he can't get at himself. And I would make sure he's escorted to his room. Each, you know, it's going to happen. Escorted, no, no, don't engage with him because he also gets off on. Tom, put that weenie back in your place. Blah, 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 blah. He gets off on any, even negative feedback is feedback. So just no, no, no. Let's go to your room. I'm going to close the door. I'm be in here. We're done. And we need to tell him you know, he's not being a gentleman because there's women around. And we do tell him to go to his room or so that's when he's just getting really agitated. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. But he knows what he's doing. Yeah. So the pants. So we move, we move the females out of the room. You know, it's sad, but oh no. Just, and you know, you can do the firm mom thing. I do the firm mom thing. I'll, Tom, put it away. Get up, we're going. It's hard to teach female young staff to not smile, and because they give the wrong visual. Oh, don't do that, oh, stop, I'm married. I don't give a rip if you're married. I want you to say, no, not okay, zip it, and out of here. I mean in a fierce voice, really clear, not acceptable, move it out. Now, and then throw something on them. We have uh, ponchos. I don't know if you've seen them there for bathing. For folks that don't want to undress, you can put a bath poncho over them and then undress them. You can wash them in the poncho. Uh, sometimes it helps to put them on the guys. You just put it over their head. So they're covered here. Because if you try to throw a blanket on them, they just take it off and throw it on. Say, we're, we're going to your room. It, it's OK to have limits because other residents have rights. They have the right to not see that. I appreciate you bringing that up because I think that that's a very common thing. In my situation, it's home care. Um, doing, and I'm realizing some of the vulnerabilities, the vulnerability of seniors at home alone or whatever. But I'm hearing a lot of time. I think it's important to teach those things of what you're saying, being able to distinguish between a male who is asking perhaps to be stroked by the young 
attractive female caregiver and um, someone who is uh, truly predatory. Yeah, predatory. I yeah. think it's important to make those distinctions. And I didn't hear much offered for the men, for the males, in terms of what is offered to them or taught to them in order to satisfy themselves. Or maybe some women with vibrators and and, you know, you don't usually have to tell men how to masturbate, yeah. but uh, yeah. <laughs> generally it's not it's not as big of an issue because well, uh, whatever. But being teaching caregivers that first thing in the morning is more likely of sexual arousal, having you know again these young sweet cute caregivers go in and try to get somebody up from bed in the morning, you know they're going to be aroused and just say you know I'll give you a minute I'll come back. You do what you need to do. No attitude, no nothing. Yeah. Just this is normal, you know. And so talking to them about when they walk in and somebody's sexually gratifying themselves. We have one guy that uh, is, he, you know, he tries for his privacy and all the rest of it, and he he uh, has a prescription to one of the I don't know, Playboy or something, one of the magazines, and it comes. And when he comes, everybody knows he's going to his room and he's going to look at it and whatever time of day. And we're going to make sure the door's locked, closed and locked so that other people don't come in. And he wants privacy, but if somebody comes in and leaves the door open, the door will just be open and it's on you for going in. He won't get up and close it. So we have to teach our staff that, that that's, his, you know, that's his signal. We're, we're staying out of there. Do you need an order and approval for uh, like a onesie outfit? Is that deemed a restraint in one way or another, or is that something you could just do without? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't. I've never written an order for. Well, I have written orders for onesies. Usually, staff already have figured that out to try to put them in a onesie because um, they're disrobing the rest of it. Uh, you can get an order. I don't think anybody would care. I don't know that it's needed. And yes, is it a restraint? Um, probably you could make that argument, or you could make the argument that it's a dignity thing for him. And it, it's, so he doesn't expose himself because he doesn't know better, than, and that's disturbing, and I'm sure he would not want that if he were in his right mind. <coughs> I don't know if you would or wouldn't, but you could always say that. Okay, I think. Any other questions? This is Pearl, and she's my little black dog. And she comes to work. She's very helpful for end of life conversations. I'm just saying, she's a great little lab petter. Any questions on sex? More than you ever really want to know, I'm sure. Okay, do we get a break? Should we have a little break? Sure. Let's have a little break and then I can put the other tools in there.